Tonight, I want to talk about dedication. Um, we are sort of in the season of dedication. We've got a lot of stuff coming up um, that's Hanukkah themed. This is sort of the Hanukkah month. Um, and it's such an important topic, but it's something that I think we don't quite fully understand what it means to be dedicated. And every year around this time of year, you know, we, people start to think about their New Year's resolutions. We start to think about what it is that we want to change in our lives. People start, you know, if you've been in this walk and done Hanukkah a few times, you start to talk about dedicating the temple and cleansing your own temple. And we kind of t- address this from a lot of different angles. But there's another one that I think we haven't quite talked about yet, and I want to focus on that tonight. If you look at the biblical calendar, and I think to understand what God does in the natural and in the spiritual, you have to kind of look at how God laid out the year to function. In the biblical calendar, if you get back to your Old Testaments and even in your New Testaments, um, everything that really, really mattered was decided in the winter. Um, if you look at the year of Jubilee, you look at the, uh, the freeing of the captives, you look at the properties being restored to the rightful owners, you look at all these things. These all happened right after the Feast of Tabernacles. So as soon as the fall feasts were concluded and during this winter season was when all of these fundamental decisions for Israel, their economy, their nation, their homelands, their towns, it was all decided now. This was the season of planting. They didn't wait till the spring to plant the wheat. If you didn't have the wheat in the ground in the winter, it wasn't going to come up in the spring. Everything in biblical culture revolved around the decisions that were made in the winter. Um, it was essentially the start of their fiscal year, as it, as it is for us too. Um, it was very important to take stock of what your life was like during the winter. Um, Depending on the decisions that were made in the winter, it would drastically change the next year or even the next 50 years of Israeli society. And so I don't want us to lose sight of that. You know, Hanukkah, I feel like fundamental. you know, we had this beautiful winter scene that was provided for us by the venue. I, feel like, I felt like we needed to kosherize it, so put a menorah up there and now it's kosher. Um, that's all it takes if you, if you weren't aware, but... But Hanukkah is the Feast of Dedication, and I feel like fundamentally, it's always fascinated me that most Christians don't celebrate it. Um, Most Protestant Catholic denominations do not even do much to acknowledge it, if anything at all. Um, Which is ironic, because it's not an Old Testament holiday. It's never once mentioned in the Old Testament. It didn't even start until after the Old Testament had been written and concluded. Um... The only part of any Bible that actually even directly addresses it is the New Testament. It is fundamentally a Christian holiday. The only people in the Bible who are celebrating it were Yeshua and his apostles. Um, And so we're in sort of this unique thing that I feel like for me as a believer, I want to do what Yeshua did. I don't care what other people groups, what other religions, what other nations may or may not have done certain traditions at certain times. I want to do what Yeshua did and what he taught us to do. And the Bible's clear that Yeshua kept the feast of, of, of Hanukkah, the festival of Hanukkah. And it wasn't just a coincidence. People are like, well, I've, just because the Bible says he was in the temple, that doesn't mean he was actually doing Hanukkah. Well, <laughs> that'd be like being in Washington, D.C. on the 4th of July and having to have made a multi-day trek to get there and just happened to be there. Like, it took a, a tremendous degree of intentionality in order to get into the temple and in order to be in Jerusalem, especially for these large holidays. Nobody was just accidentally there. In Scripture, one of the key verses that talks about this is John 10. So I want to look at this concept of dedication, what it means for us to be dedicated. And hopefully we can look at what it meant scripturally, but then also apply things and and harvest things out that, that can hopefully change our own lives as well. And this is the story I was just telling you about. It says in John 10, verse 22, At that time, the Feast of Dedication, or Hanukkah, took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Yeshua was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. The Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, or if you are Mashiach, tell us plainly. Yeshua answered and said, I told you, but you did not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. But if you do not believe, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. 
And the key thing is here in verse 27, he says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give the eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. He talks about how a certain group of people are his sheep. And the thing that makes them his sheep is that they follow him. They obey him. They do what he has told them to do. They are obedient. They're walking like well-trained sheep after their shepherd. They're dedicated to him. And I think it's that act of dedication that he happens to be talking about in the temple during the feast of dedication that really matters. He's not saying that these are my sheep just because they really, really love me. Or these are my sheep because they cry at worship services. Or these are my sheep because they think fondly of doctrines and scriptures and holiness matters. He says, these are my sheep because of what they do. They follow him. And that really is the key of dedication. Dedication is this ridiculously popular topic in our society. We talk about dedication being dedicated to your craft, being dedicated to your work. You know, we talk about people in all sorts of different capacities of life. We'll be like, well, that man is really dedicated to his family. You know, that guy is really dedicated to his job. That child is really dedicated to the violin or whatever. You know, we have all these different concepts that we talk about. And we have kind of this noble picture of what dedication is. Um, and I think that's part of it. But that's not all of it. According to uh, the Webster's Dictionary, and this has been the same since it was first published, it describes dedication as to devote to the worship of a divine being. I think for a lot of us, that's kind of what we think about. You, know, you think about like a church or a monument or something being dedicated. Um, you think of, you know, big priest in robes coming in and hominum, shamanum, babadum. I don't, I don't speak Latin. And then all of a sudden it's dedicated, you know, like it, it becomes a thing. You know, we christen the little kids and we put a couple drops on them or whatever. And then there's like some magical property is bestowed upon them. And that's generally in our English language what we consider to something to be dedicated towards. It's when you kind of just, ugh, you just, you just bless it or project it. But I think we need to rethink that definition. That's how it's defined in English, and it's not that any of those things are bad. Certainly there are blessings in Scripture, there are initiation ceremonies in Scripture, there are all sorts of wonderful rituals that you can do. But is that what the Bible's talking about when it talks about dedication? Especially in this concept, this concept of Hanukkah. Beyond that, and I think we have to understand it because if the question we need to be asking ourselves at all times is what are we dedicated to? To whom, to what, for what purpose do we have dedication in our lives? And that's a big question. What are the things that you are dedicated to? But do you even know what that means? Do we even know what it means? Do we know what it could also mean? The root word where we get Hanukkah is the word Hanak. Say it, Hanak, Hanach. The more ch you put into it, the more pretend Israeli you can pretend to be. Hanach, Hanak. It's essentially this word that is... is it's a unique word. It's only used five times in the Bible. Um, which when you think in the Bible about all the times things are blessed and consecrated and devoted. And this word, where we get Hanukkah, is only mentioned five times in the entire Old Testament. It doesn't necessarily mean just to like slap some holy water on something. What it actually means in its most literal form is it means to narrow something or to kind of bridle something. It means to discipline something. So when it's saying that something is dedicated to something, it doesn't just mean that like somebody put a plaque on something and now this is dedicated to the memory of Aunt Sally. It's saying that this is a process, a thing, a person, an idea, a system, a culture, whatever it is, that has somehow been put through this narrowing, this refining of behaviors and processes so that it can be properly implemented. That's what it means for something to be dedicated. 
scripturally. And the funny thing, it's a, kind of a visual picture of it. You know, Hebrew is a very visual, physical language. The word chanak actually comes from a, a root word in Hebrew that's actually the word for the, for the roof of your mouth, your palate, or your gums. And they, they liken it to, and they say, well, what, what does that have to do with being guided and trained? That's how you steer a horse. You put a bridle and a bit in their mouth, and it's by moving the mouth that you can actually train something. It's how you train a newborn baby. The way you get a newborn baby to eat, touch the roof of its mouth. And that's how you train it in its most fundamental capacity. And it has this, this message and this implication that there's this fundamental training component. This raising from infancy to something useful. That is what it means to be dedicated. So what it is not also matters. If, if being dedicated, if being chanakt means to be trained, to be bridled, to be constrained and narrowed in a particular direction, it means it's not just a mental exercise. It means it's not just a ceremony. It's not just like this moment of positive thinking. And I feel like so often in our lives here in America, you know, we have such a Greco-Roman influence in our culture that we think you know, the highest possible human achievement is just some sort of mental ascent. That like, if we can just think enough positive thoughts and have enough good vibes and great feelings that somehow we will ascend to some sort of plane of holiness. And then we will have a great relationship with the Lord. And then there will be peace on earth. The Bible is much more tactile than that. It's focused on behaviors and experiences. And yes, your heart, body, mind, soul, all of these things have to come together. But it's not just this mental ascent. Being dedicated to something doesn't just mean passion. It doesn't just mean desire. It doesn't just mean I really, really like my job. It means that I'm trained, that I'm constrained, that I am equipped in that direction. Biblically, this concept of dedication, when we talk about the Feast of Dedication, when we talk about Hanukkah and the temple being dedicated, we have to understand that it is talking about an action. It is talking about the verb of training something for an intended purpose. So when we look at our own lives and we say, am I dedicated to my wife, to my children, to my job, to my country, you know, on whatever levels, you may feel like you need to be dedicated to something. The question is not like how emotionally engaged are you, though that helps, absolutely. The question is, what actions are you taking that give evidence to that? What steps in your training and in your development, in your process, are you walking through intentionally to achieve that outcome? And it's a fundamental difference. As I mentioned, it's only mentioned, five, this word, this concept, is only mentioned five times in the whole Bible. Um, the first place it's mentioned is actually in Deuteronomy 20. So it doesn't even get into the Torah until we're in the fifth book of the Bible. If you have your Bibles, let's go there. So this is describing sort of civil law. It's describing how the government and the military of Israel is going to work. Um, and that's the first place that we find this, this message of what it m could mean to be dedicated. There's this concept of the law of first use that oftentimes people talk about in the Bible where it's it's this general principle that maybe you should let the words and the concepts and the people in the Bible be defined by how they're first mentioned in the Bible, rather than reading the book from the back to the front. <laughs> um, so in Deuteronomy 20, this is the first case. And it's not this grandiose mental exercise that we think of with dedication. It's very, very literal. In verse 1, it says, When you go out to battle against your enemies and you see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you, do not be afraid, for Yahweh your God, who brought you up from the land of Egypt, he is with you. When you are approaching the battle, the priest shall come near and speak to the people. He shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, you are approaching the battle against your enemies today. Do not be faint-hearted. Do not be afraid or panic or tremble before them. For Yahweh your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. And this is where it comes in. It says in the in verse 5, the officers also shall speak to the people saying, who is a man who has built a new house and has not dedicated it? That's the first mention of this word that we get Hanukkah, that we get dedication, that we get the feast of dedication from, 
is this concept of a man who has built a house, established a homestead, and it, for whatever reason has not yet trained it, hasn't established it. It says, let him depart and return to his house. Otherwise, he might die in battle and another man would dedicate it. What does that mean? Because in our minds, we would say, well, if I'm going to dedicate my house, that means I'm going to have 10 spiritual people walk around my house with trumpets and we're going to anoint the doorposts with oil and we're going to write Bible verses on the studs. You know, all these things that we do as evangelical Christians here in America. Um, that's how we would dedicate a house. But that's not what this is talking about. This is saying that if a person has established a homestead and he hasn't had a chance to really train his homestead, you know, this is an agricultural society. This is a society where if you built a house, you know, you can't just call the contractor and stuff. Like, you have to actually get your house and your family taken care of. He's saying that this person should go back and get his house and his household trained up just to get his house moving right. It goes on to also talk about how, like, if you're, if you're a man who's engaged to a woman, you're dismissed from the military so that you can go and establish your family. It's the same sort of concept. It's very tangible. It's not just this glorious mental exercise. It's not, you know, in our minds, when we talk about dedicating, we would think, like, a christening. Like, we're going to break a bottle of champagne across the bow of the boat or, you know, what a waste. But, like... That's what we think of, like a dedication ceremony. It's not saying a prayer. And it's not even, in this case, it's not even doing what Webster said it was. It's not devote, dedicating something to the worship of a divine being. Although you could, but that's, that sort of oath is something separate. It's literally saying that a man just needs to go back and get his house operating properly before he goes off and risks his life in a battle. It's training and initiating something for proper usage. That's the key. That's what it truly means to be dedicated, is to train and or initiate something for its proper use. So then we go on in scripture. And this is a particularly poignant uh, story, is when Solomon dedicated the temple. The Israelites had had the tabernacle for all these years. David wanted to build a temple. Yahweh was not thrilled with him being the uh, craftsman of it, so Solomon built the temple. And this, these are the only other times until we get to Proverbs where this concept of dedication is mentioned again. And a lot of you already know the, the story. You know, they build this elaborate temple. It's the most beautiful thing that's existed at the time. Um, the Spirit of God comes down on it. Um, there's all these sacrifices and all this stuff. And so Let's just read the story. Second Chronicles 7. It says in verse 1, Now when Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of Yahweh filled the house. The priests could not enter into the house of Yahweh because the glory of Yahweh filled Yahweh's house. All the sons of Israel, seeing the fire, came down, and the glory of Yahweh upon the house bowed down on the pavement with their faces on the ground, and they worshipped and gave praise to Yahweh, saying, Truly, he is good, and his loving kindness is everlasting. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifice before Yahweh. King Solomon, king Solomon offered a sacrifice of 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. Thus the king and all of the people dedicated the house of God. So in doing all of these things, this is the time where Solomon and all the people, it says they all did it together. It's through this incredible ritual and the establishment and the, of the priesthood and all the stuff that's taking place here in this, this new facility. This is where the dedication occurs. In some Bibles, I think this one says that they consecrated it. Um, different translations will use different words, but it's the same Hebrew word, chanak. The same story, again, is in 1 Kings 8. Um, so there's, of course, two witnesses. Solomon blesses the people, and he says, Let your heart, therefore, be wholly devoted to Yahweh our God, and to walk in his statutes, to keep his commandments as at this day. Now the king and all Israel with him offered sacrifice before Yahweh. Solomon offered for the sacrifice of peace offerings, which he offered to Yahweh, 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. So the king and all the sons of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord. 
So we've already read four of the only five times where this word is even used, this concept of Shkanak. It's in the story of Solomon, and it's in the commandment about a guy getting his house set up. Solomon dedicated the temple not by just christening it, not by putting a plaque on the door, not by just even blessing it with his presence. And it doesn't even say that his prayer, which is amazing, doesn't say that is what dedicated the temple. He's saying that this, this level of dedication, this training, which is probably a more accurate word, it says Solomon trained the temple. The way that he did that was through the sacrifices. All of this other stuff also happened, and that was awesome and holy and good. But it says when Solomon made these abundant sacrifices, that is when Solomon trained the temple. Solomon trained the temple by showing this outrageous generosity. They weren't commanded to give this level of sacrifice. But Solomon showed the people, he showed Israel, he showed the priests, he showed everyone what this temple was capable of. How the presence of God, because you have to remember the story, God's presence, this cloud and smoke, had already descended on the temple. Everybody was already, the priests and everybody were already on their faces. Then they give this incredible sacrifice. And Solomon is training the people, that when you're in the presence of God, this is how you respond. That's what it meant to dedicate the temple. It was by walking them through the training so that they would know how to be generous, that they would know how to worship, that they would know how to respond to the presence of God in their lives. He didn't just christen it. It wasn't just that Solomon said a prayer and then the temple was dedicated, established, whatever you want to call it. He actually went through the work, the acts of obedience, the acts of righteousness, the acts of worship, and that is how he trained the temple. If we take those concepts whether it's a man setting up a house or Solomon sacrificing an insane amount of animals for the glory of God. If we take that same concept, it becomes so clear what it actually means to dedicate something. It's to go through the action of demonstrating how things should properly be done. That's what it means to dedicate something. It takes work it takes intentional modeling. It takes concerted effort. Not just feelings. And then we get to the last use of this word. And we love kids around here. So y'all have probably used this one a lot. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. It's in Proverbs. It's the exact same word. For some reason there, it doesn't say dedicate up a child. <laughs> it's the exact same Hebrew word. There it actually literally translated it almost exactly how it should be in our English language. It says to train up a child. Solomon trained up the temple in the way it should go. This man who is supposed to train up his household before he goes off to war. That's what it means to be dedicated. It's to train up. We have to understand that. We have to model and practice what should be done. When we're training up our children, when we're training up, maybe not your biological children, maybe they're spiritual children. We're all supposed to be training up spiritual children in the faith. We have to be modeling the correct way of living righteously. We have to be striving to teach and to train and to edify and encourage and build up our cultures, our congregations, our communities, our families, everything that you're a part of. It's a very serious business, and yes, it is exhausting. It's going to take a ton of work. That's what it means to be dedicated. 
It's you put in the work. But there's this interesting, so this word, hanak, is a tricky one. Because there is a homonym, or a homophone, if you want to get technical, for the exact same Hebrew word. It has the exact same sound. It's hanak. It has a slightly different letter on the end but it's pronounced the same, essentially. And it actually means to strangle something, to choke it to death. And so there's this interesting thing where we are called, we are told to train up our children. We are told, and we're given the example of training up the temple, training up the people of Israel to worship God. We're given all of these examples in the Bible, but there is this utterly fine detail that separates training between choking. And a lot of y'all have probably experienced that in life. <laughs> and a lot of times it is those tiny little details, misapplied, that can make all the difference in your marriage, in your work, in your parenting, between whether you are effectively training and dedicating up your children towards the things that are appropriate and respectful and useful and good and holy righteous, or whether you're choking them. So that's something we have to think about too. Because as much as we have this potential to train, and we should, the details matter. How you do it matters. And it doesn't just matter for other people. I know plenty of people who have choked themselves, spiritually, emotionally, physically. There are plenty of people who are their own worst enemy. And I, I wholeheartedly believe that for the vast majority of us, y'all, there is no one in this world who is ever going to sabotage you more than you will sabotage yourself. Maybe you're an exception. Maybe you're one of these people who's lived an extraordinarily terrible life and you fall outside of that, but for most people, the choking doesn't come from without, it comes from within. The point being that we can't be casual about the training. We have to get it right. And I say this in the concept of like, yes, your family, absolutely. In your marriage, absolutely. In your workplace, you know, when you're training an employee on every level, the details matter. You have to take it seriously. It's true of every single aspect of life. If you want dedicated employees, if you want children who are dedicated to the Lord, if you want a spouse who is dedicated to you, if you want you know, whatever we all want. You have to put in the work. You have to do it correctly. You have to pay attention to the details. You have to realize the full impact of the consequences of what you're doing. We have to consider the training. And that's what I hope for this season as we get ready for Hanukkah that we'll all do, is that we'll consider the training. I think every single one of us is in training. We do it every single day of our lives. And there's a lot of great books and things you can read about habit formation and how people can change their behaviors and live a more productive life. All of that is training. The decisions you're going to make to come here, that's training for yourself, for your children, and for others. The decisions you're going to make the moment you walk out the doors. You're training something, and you're definitely training someone. You're training yourself, if nothing else. Everyone is watching you. Even if you don't think they are. You know, we live in a society, as the kids say. Everything is interconnected. But we're supposed to. The scriptural precedent, we're supposed to be training up one another. We're supposed to be training our children. But we're also supposed to be being trained. And I think that's the part that's probably the harder bit. 
it's easy for me to sit here and tell you how you should live your life. We all have opinions about that. Nobody ever takes our advice, but we all have opinions on that. It's a lot harder for us to train ourselves. I can look at someone with terrible habits and point out every single one of them if they wanted me to. You all could. It's a heck of a lot harder to notice the bad habits and the, the ways that you've been mistrained in your own life. And so I want you to take this season that we're about to go through. This isn't just Hanukkah. It's not just the Festival of Lights. This is the holiday of training. This is when we celebrate the fact that God trained his temple, that God brought his people into salvation, into redemption, into deliverance, so that they could be trained. Training requires intentionality. You have to have a goal, you've got to have a plan, and you have to put in the behaviors to make it happen. If you're missing any one of those three things, you're not training. And this is true whether you want to train your six-pack or train your dog or train your employees. You have to have a goal, you have to have a plan, and you have to put in the physical, personal behaviors to make it happen. Being emotionally dedicated to something isn't going to get it done in and of itself. So examples of this is like if I want to train my children to be generous, what am I doing to actually give them opportunities to be generous? And you know, there's things that you can start to think about. If I, can, if I considered every moment of my life with my kids as a moment where I should be teaching them to behave righteously, but also to be generous to others, then maybe as a parent it means that like, I keep a case of water in the car, I keep a pack of granola bars in the car, so that way when the homeless man is on the side of the road, the kid can actually roll the window down and hand it to them. Not me. I mean, sure, it's great if your kids can see you doing the right thing too, but let the kids do it. I remember even when I was a little child, my parents would let me put the little check in the offering box from time to time. There was like nine kids, so we fought over it. But, but you know, we would all, little offering plates, you, you know, it was a normal church. They actually took up an offering. Like, you know, you come down the aisles and put your little thing in the plate. And like, it was awesome. And I didn't really realize it at the time. And maybe they didn't either. They may have thought they were just distracting the kids for a few minutes. Like... But the reality is that it's those moments that you're training your child to be generous. You're training them to give back. You're training them to live righteously, to not be materialistic. You know, there's so many different lessons just in that. There's other people, and not every training is going to always be a, an achievement, if you will. Not everybody's motivated by that. Not everybody's going to, I need to train my finances so I could buy a certain house, or I need to train my behavior so I can have a certain friend group or whatever. You know? Not everybody's going to be motivated by that. Some people are more abstract. But even stuff like, you know, people say stuff like, I just want to be more spiritual? That is the dumbest thing I have ever heard. Everyone is already spiritual. It's like someone saying, like, I just want to be more physical, like, you're already physical, and you're spiritual, and you're mental, and you're emotional. Like, everybody already is. You can't train to be spiritual. But you can train to be righteous. Righteousness are those behaviors that come out of having a connection to God. Perhaps from being spiritual, but... It has to be something that you can plan. Something that has a clear goal, and something that you can assign behaviors to. Solomon literally sacrificed animals. We're supposed to actually put in the behaviors and the work and the time to train up our kids. Not just think positive thoughts long enough. So even if your goal is something as abstract as like, if you realize that you need training to be more righteous, to have more godliness in your life, you have to put in the effort. A tackle, tackle it the exact same way that you would a fitness regimen or something. You know, if you want to run a marathon, everybody here knows that the 
you're going to have to start jogging at some point. We understand that. It's very physical. It's very obvious. If you want to be happy, if you want to have a relationship with the Lord, if you want to have peace in your life, if you want to not feel shame and guilt for everything that you've done and are doing, there's an equally clear plan for those things too. That's what the Bible's for. That's what those acts of righteousness produce. It is a training. We are supposed to be training ourselves and training one another. And I guess I'll close with this thought. It's just, if you're not actively training yourself, your family, your coworkers, your community, your church, you know, if you're not actively involved in that training, you're not living a dedicated life. If you are not consciously putting in the effort to see improvement, maybe it is emotional improvement. Maybe it is relational improvement. Maybe it is financial improvement. Whatever it is, if you're not training, either being trained or training others, you're not dedicated. We have to consider that all of our behavior is our training. Everything you do in this life is your training. You're either training yourself or you're training others. That's how habits work. That's how cultures are built. That's how societies are shaped. It's by the things that we just do. And so I would encourage you, especially as we get ready for this next couple of weeks, as, and as in our own little secular world, as we get ready for the new year, do a hard inventory of what you are actually training in your life. What patterns, what systems, what recurring things are you settling for? Are you embracing? Are you causing? And if they're good, double down on them. If they're bad, if they're causing you pain or just distraction or anything else, implement a training program. <laughs> Work through your stuff. You are worth it. God loves you. He wants you to be righteous. He wants you to have peace. But we have to do the work. We have to be trained. So embrace the training. Thank you all for being here. It's great to be with you. Mm -hmm.